1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. At war with peace. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 17. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so it is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. We have great instructions there from the word of God in First Peter chapter 2. The Book of War and Peace. Anybody ever read it? The novel? Well, it's a novel by Russian author Leo Tolstoy, which is regarded as a central work of, liter of world literature and one of Tolstoy Tolstoy's finest literary achievements. The novel chronicles the history of the French invasion of Russia and the impact of the Napoleonic area, era on the Tsarist society through the stories of the five Russian aristocratic families. Let me read that again. Tolstoy said, War and Peace is not a novel, even less it is a poem, and still less an historical chronicle. Large sections, especially the later chapters, are a philosophical discussion rather than narrative. It is mostly known for being 1,225 pages rather than its content. <laughs> you know, that's like reading War and Peace. You know, you talk about somebody has something a lot to do or a lot to read, you might as well read War and Peace because it's such a big book. Today we are at war with peace. People don't want war, but they don't live like they want peace. We fuss, we argue, we, uh, nations fight, nations have turmoil, families argue and fight, but everyone is calling for peace. The humanists who believe that man will solve all his problems 6,000 years later, man fights and battles and fusses worse than ever. Talked about that this morning, about universalism. Those who believe in universalism, that everyone is going to, to heaven, have some susplaining to do. If everyone's going to heaven and we act like this, how's heaven any different than the earth? It certainly won't be free from sin if sinful man gets there without having to deal with his sin. So... Uh, you have to have, man has to be born again. Man has to be born from above. Man has to have, his, have a new nature. We can't go to heaven like this. We'd, we're not qualified anyway, but we'd start a war in heaven. I mean, it would, you can't, you have to have, you have to be changed. You have to be given uh, the spirit of God so that you can live with God. I mean, we're made of God in his image, but we are not like him in our sin, and that has to be obliterated, done away with. As I uh, wrote in my article in Facebook, uh, I think it's 920, Daniel 9.27, is sin will be brought to an end. What a glorious day that will be when sin comes to an end. That means no one can sin anymore. Wouldn't that be a great day? Not even hell. People in hell can sin anymore. Now, they don't think about that. Well, I'm going to party with my boys all for eternity. No, you're not. Sin will come to an end. All you've got left, boy, is punishment. Man is at war with peace. Man seeks peace but cannot attain it himself. Man pursues a false and temporary peace. Every individual is in a war with his, within himself because, between the peace of God and the will of man. There's a war going on in our members between God's will and your will. Let's look at how Peter explains being at war with peace. First of all, verse 11. Peace with yourself. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. I appeal to you, my friends, as strangers and refugees in this world. We are strangers on this earth. Our real home is in heaven. From the day you trusted Christ, Peter is explaining that we have a higher standard because we have been born again from above. We've got a higher standard. We're not like everybody else. Our hope is in Christ who in, 
in, is in heaven at the right hand of God. So we're citizens of heaven from the moment you trust in Christ. You have a higher standard, a heavenly standard to live by. Well, you can't live up to that. No, you can't be perfect. But you're forgiven sins past, present, and future. So now you have a relationship with a heavenly father who wants you to obey him and follow him. And when you sin, you sin against your father, not against your creator. You're not, when you sin against your creator, you're piling up sins against judgment. When you sin against your father, you're displeasing him. And there's a big difference between displeasing the judge and displeasing your father. The judge will send you to jail. The father will send you to your room. Quite a bit of difference. <laughs> the judge can put you on the gallows. Your father can make you clean the gallon tank or spray gallons of water on the sidewalk. Big difference. 1 Peter 2.11 Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Here's the war. Do not give in to bodily passions which are always at war against the soul which is in war with yourself. Beloved, I implore you as aliens and strangers and exiles to abstain from sensual urges, evil desires, the passions, passions of the flesh, your lower nature that wage war against the soul. We are at war and always will be until we leave this sinful flesh. You're at war with the flesh until you die. The flesh dies. It's a war between the Holy Spirit within you and your sinful flesh. Just don't think you can walk away from your sinful habits anytime you want to. It takes the power of God and the Holy Spirit. We just can't one day decide, I'm just going to quit. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. I guess it can be done, but it's very difficult. You need help. The devil took a lot of doing to get you in a snare, and it takes some doing to get you out of a snare, and it's called he's called the Holy Spirit. He has to help you and guide you and strengthen you and change your wanter. When you're surrendered to Christ, your want to's change. The devil snares us and traps us before we know it. First Timothy 3, 7, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You ever caught anything in a trap? Animals know they're in big trouble when they're in a snare, in a trap. They'll chew their leg off. Anything to get free, because they know that's not a good place to be. 1 Peter 2.12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers. Your conduct among the heathen should be so good that when, and they will, just accuse you of being evildoers at times, your conduct will put all that to rest. But they will speak about you and speak evil of you because you're doing what's right. Your good will be evil spoken of. So we should conduct ourselves. Conversation means your conduct, having your conduct honest among the Gentiles. We should conduct ourselves properly, honorably, righteously among the Gentiles. That is non-Christians. They use that term here uh, as non-Christians, even though Gentiles were, uh, of course, Christians too. Anyone can be saved, but... He was using that as a, in general. Uh, conduct, conduct yourself properly among the Gentiles so that all they may, they may slander you as evildoers, accuse you of doing evil. Your conduct will disprove them that you're not doing wrong. We have peace with ourselves when we do things that please God. We have peace with God when we have our sins forgiven. We get peace from God when we do what pleases Him. Living for yourself will guarantee you a war with peace. Living for yourself will guarantee you're going to have war with peace. You're not going to have peace. You're going to have war within you. That they may by your good works which they shall behold. Glorify God in the day of visitation. They will praise God. Because of your good deeds, they will praise God on the day of His coming. That's what that means. They may by witnessing your good deeds come to glorify God in the day of inspection when God shall look upon uh, you wanderers as a, uh, as a pastor or a shepherd looks over his flock. They will have to recognize and admit your good deeds. It says, 
having your conversation, your conduct, honest among the Gentiles, honest, that is good behavior, that when they speak evil against you, they may by your good works, that which they shall behold, people see what you're doing, they know what you're doing, you can't get away with anything in secret, really, anything you do on the internet is going to be saved forever, anything you do, uh, eventually you'll do it enough, you'll get caught, you'll get bolder and bolder, and then you get caught, like, let's say, shoplifting. You start out with a penny candy, and then you go up to a 65-inch color TV. Yes, people think they've tried to shoplift those things. They just got bolder and bolder and have gotten away with it, believe it or not. Uh, you'd be surprised how many TVs Walmart is missing in a year's time. Well, they've got them locked down, people everywhere. You grab one off, grab a box off the shelf and put it in your cart and take off. And if you're criminally minded enough, you know when the opportunity is to go out. Listen. The criminal mind is working 24 hours a day, isn't it? It never sleeps. We have peace with God when we have our sins forgiven. We get peace from God when we do what pleases Him. But living for yourself, to steal, to plunder, that ruins your life. That they may by your good works, which they shall see, glorify God in the day of visitation. Don't think, though, on the opposite time, a turn, that people don't see the good that you do. The hard work that you do for Christ. The little things you do for Christ. The things you post on Facebook. If, and some of you post some very good things. Think that doesn't go unnoticed. And I'm not saying Facebook's all in all. I'm just saying the kindness you show to your family or your uh you come to church faithfully. People see your car parked out there. Or you uh, uh, read the word of God each day. God will bless you for that. And see that others get a blessing through your life some way, somehow. Peace with yourself. Secondly, peace with civil authorities. 1 Peter 2.13 Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Aha. Got to pay your taxes. For the sake of the Lord, submit yourselves to every human authority, to the emperor who is the supreme authority. Be submissive to every human institution and authority for the sake of the Lord, whether it be to the emperor as supreme. This means that every magistrate, judge, sheriff, county official, up to the president of the United States is to be obeyed in their position, respected. One exception. No, not that guy. Acts 5.29. <laughs> then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. When they ask you, what if they ask you to give up your weapons, the civil authorities? The Bible says, submit yourselves to every ordinance. What if there's a gun ordinance tomorrow? You have to obey it. We give them up. And vote them out next election. <laughs> you think Peter... Now think about this. You think Paul or Peter wasted time on civil matters. Never, not once, did they recommend going to Rome to protest slavery, homosexual behavior, uh, prostitution, and taxes. Not once did they go to Rome and organize a protest. Boys, we're going to sail in three weeks. We've got ten flotillas going to Rome to protest taxes. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul wasting one second that he could have been preaching the gospel on civil matters? Now, he was a good Roman citizen. Remember, he appealed to Rome. He knew the law. And he used it to his advantage. But they didn't want to waste any time. Do you ever think about this? Not once did they go to Rome to protest slavery. <coughs> now the kind of slavery they had then was not like the slave traders came to Africa and stole people away and treated them like animals. You were a slave until you paid your debts. And you were, there were rules and, about slavery. But you were a slave, but you, once you paid your debts, you were free. And uh, that's just the way society worked then. And uh, that's, that's what slavery 
it's not a good thing, but it's not a good thing to be in debt either. So both weren't good, but necessary, I guess, in society. It's a waste of time. Now think about this. It's a waste of time to change a person who does not know God. It's a waste of time to try to, try to change a person or a society that does not know God. Why? He'll go back to the mud. 2 Peter 2.22 But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his vomit, a sow that's washed to her wallowing in the mire. Clean up society. Take a bulldozer to Dempsey Housing Project or the projects in New York City or the one there in Huntington. Take a bulldozer, doze it, doze it down. What's going to happen? They'll just move somewhere else and it'll be worse. They go back to the mud. Peter and Paul knew that the only hope for mankind was the gospel's power to change individuals one at a time. That's what they concentrated on, and that's what we should concentrate on, the gospel to change individuals' lives. But the Lord, the God of the Bible, will do what is right and just and holy. He will not be fair because he cannot not be fair. I mean, he's all, he does what he does, and that makes it fair. It's like your daddy when he says, well, Dad, that's not fair. I, I don't care if it's fair or not. You're going to do what I say. That makes it fair, right? <laughs> yes, sir, that's fair to me. <laughs> makes it right. <laughs> when your boss at work says, I told you to, to load, unload those ten pallets. Well, she only had to do one, but I told you to do ten, and that makes it right. You may say, that ain't fair. Why isn't it? You agreed to take this job. You agreed to do the work. Do the work that you're asked to do. That makes it fair. He puts us where we can be successful. He's not going to be fair to you. Do you want fair? Uh, no. You want justice? No, not from God. If I got justice, I never would have had a chance to be saved. If I got what's fair, I'd, I'd be in hell too. I want mercy and justice. I want God to put me where he wants me. And I can be of most good to him. Not what I think is fair. I don't have any idea what's fair. To governors. We've got to get on with the governors here. Because this is very important. 1 Peter 2.14 Warn the governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Governors. They've been appointed by God to punish evildoers. Governors means your national rulers or leaders. Uh, governmental leaders means it's what governors are. Sent to bring vengeance, punishment, justice to those who do wrong. That's what the role of government is. The government has two roles, to punish evildoers and to maintain an infrastructure. The governments were never set up to collect taxes and to minister welfare and all this stuff that they're into. They were only meant to give you a road to drive on and protect you by the military and put people, uh, make sure people behave. That's it. But well, man, they have way overstretched. You know, uh, President Trump said he, for every regulation he puts in, he wants two done away with. That's refreshing. For every regulation, new regulation, he wants two off the books. Wow. I hope he can do that. Business is so regulated, no wonder they're leaving for other countries. They just let them produce their goods and sell them. What's so hard about that? Why do we have to regulate them? Why do we have to discourage people who want to be in business? My goodness, you try to start your own business, good luck. The red tape and the taxes, and the, it's ridiculous. And Just let people work and do their job, and they'll figure it out, how to pay one another. 1 Peter 2.14 continues, And for the praise of them that do well. Governments, how do they praise you for doing well? They encourage you to do good service by not bothering you, <laughs> pretty much. If the government leaves you alone, they're saying, attaboy. And that's what the government does. When they leave you alone, let you transport yourself and buy and sell, you are doing just an outstanding job in your citizenship. Uh, now, if you can keep going and do evil and not get caught, you may think you're a good citizen, that you're getting by with it, but eventually they'll get you. Some they never do. But we've got a thing called conscience that'll get you. For the praise of them that do well, that's what the government does. They punish evildoers. They put people away, even though jails 
did not exist uh, until about the time, uh, two centuries, three, third century BC, uh, most criminals were just uh, thrown in dungeons to die, or they were executed, uh, or they were just banished from the area. Uh, the Apostle Paul and Peter and all those guys were put in jail. And if you think that's a nice jail, it was muddy, it was nasty, it, well, there was no bathrooms, you, that was what it was, mud up to your ankles and to your knees sometimes. How horrible, rats everywhere. I like to see people be put in jails like that today. They'd straighten up in a hurry or to avoid going back to that kind of stuff. They were chained, chained all day and all night. 1 Peter 2.17, skip on down to that. Honor all men, respect everyone, show respect for everybody. Treat people with respect, honorably. Love the brotherhood, that is the Christians. Love other Christians. Respect for everyone, but love your brothers in Christ and sisters. That's a good rule. Respect everybody. That means every religion. We don't go to Muslims and, and Jews and Catholics and Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and bash their heads in. Should I delete that? We treat them with respect as humans, not their religion. You do not have to show respect to their religion, but as fellow human beings... You show them respect and kindness because you hope to ch get a chance to win them to Christ eventually. Honor all men. Show respect to everyone, but love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Love them. 1 Peter 2.17 continues, love the brotherhood. That's other believers. It says, fear God. Here are some rules for living. Honor all men. In verse 17, love the brotherhood. Love Christians. Fear God. Honor God. Reverence God. Fear God. That means honor Him with your life. Don't disrespect God. Honor the King. Uh, respect the Emperor. Now here we go, people. This is where the President comes in. Respect the Emperor. Honor the Emperor. That is, in our day, that would be called the President. He's the, the chief. The big cheese. The President of the United States. Now, our former President, some people didn't honor him. But you should respect the position. You don't have to agree with everything they do. You don't even have to like them, but you should honor their position. That's what people aren't doing to this president. They're not respecting the position that he has. And that's going to lead to trouble. It already is. We res always respected the position of any president, whether we like them or not. But not today. They're not trying to get along with the civil authority. They're trying to cause civil unrest because they do not like this president. Now, we know some things we cannot tolerate, and we've always got to put the gospel first and God first. And there's that Acts 5.29, we've got to obey God rather than men. If they tell you you cannot read your Bible anymore, we're going to read our Bible somehow. If they tell you you can't go to church anymore and worship God, we're going to find a way, aren't we? Just like the Chinese. If they tell you you can't pray anymore, we're going to be like Daniel, aren't we? We're going to pray four times a day with the windows open. You cannot keep us from God who created us. You can't stamp him out of our lives. We're not going to let you do that. But you ask us to pay more taxes, we will. You ask us to drive on a new road, we're going to. You ask us to pay a for this uh, new tax so you can have water, better water, or police protection, we're going to do that. Why? Because we have to, unless we vote them out. But always the gospel first. We're not to be at war with peace, for we know what the Lord would rather have us concentrating our time on, the truth of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to be constantly causing trouble with the civil authorities. If, now, the disciples did over the gospel, because they weren't given the freedom to preach, they didn't get to teach. They were accused of false things too and got arrested. Now, we're not going to cause trouble with civil authorities in America that way because we have freedom of, well, we're supposed to have freedom of religion. You know, there's still people who have been put out, still being put out of business over baking cakes. Peace with civil authorities, peace with critics. Like I say all the time, Romans 1, 26 or 28, I forget which one it is. We've gone crazy 
the world has gone moronic. Uh, we're morons. And we're following morons. So don't be discouraged or upset and don't get yourself in a tizzy because people act crazy. The Bible says they would. God said they would behave like morons. They wouldn't have enough sense to come out of the rain. They wouldn't have enough sense to, to honor God. So God's going to turn them over to a reprobate, bro, bro, moronic mind. Reprobate mind. God said He would do it. And man, has He done it. He said that He would turn the world against Israel and He is doing it. He said He would turn, make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. He has done it. People, we've got to wake up. Our redemption is drawing nigh. Verse 15, back up to verse 15. Peace with critics. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. We, uh, we're going to be talked about by ignorant people who don't know really what you believe and don't know the Bible. They don't really understand, but they think they do. And they're going to cause you all kinds of trouble. Uh, it's God's in will and intention that by doing right, your honest and good lives and Christian life, you'll silence the ignorant charges of ill-informed criticism from foolish people. That's what that means. People will always criticize you or find something to criticize about you if you try to do anything. You try to make a difference in somebody's life and you're going to be criticized and maligned and mistreated. We put that to rest in that peace by continuing to, continuing to serve God and follow Him despite opposition. You just forge ahead. Forge ahead. God wants His people to ignore the opposition. He'll take care of your opposition. You just keep on keeping on preaching the gospel, living for Jesus. Verse 16, is free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. We live as free people. Do not, however, use our freedom to cover up any evil, but live as God's servants. Live as free people, not enslaved by the laws and doctrines of the world or the laws of the Judean law, the law of uh, Jews, but freedom in Christ. Not freedom to sin, but freedom to live for Christ without any burdens of law or law keeping or good deeds, or well, your bad deeds. We have freedom to serve Christ, not worry about our salvation. Just live for Him each day. That's freedom. We don't have to worry. Have we done enough to be saved? We've done enough to please God? No. You've already pleased Him because Christ pleased God. God's pleased with you when you trust in Christ. Amen. When Christ pleases God and you trust in Christ, you get Christ's righteousness given to you. What a deal. That's the difference between Christianity and all other religions. Religion says do, Christ says done. Amen. Done. Finished. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. What is finished? Salvation for the whole world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone that comes to any other way is going to be lost to me. You have to come through me. That's why Jesus rose from the dead. God sort of just could have put him on the cross and, okay, there it's paid. But he raised him from the dead so he would be different than all other religions in the world and all the competitors out there. And there's thousands, well, nearly 1,100 religions in the world. They're competitors to Christ. The devil has done a good job. He's put in the A team of Catholicism. He's got the C team of Jehovah's Witnesses. He's got the B team of Mormonism. He's got all the Fs, I think. <laughs> All oh, Buddhism and Shintoism and all these isms from the Far East. Why did the Far East have all the isms? Because there are wasms. That's they ain't it. There are wasms and they ain't nothings isms. Because they don't know God. We're always going to have critics. You're going to have critics. You're at peace with yourself. John, have peace with yourself. John sixteen thirty three. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. It is in Christ that we have peace and Christ alone. Amen.